Hi, I'm Katie Hess, agronomy. No, I'm not. What am I? Marketing. Yeah, the, the that's director right. Of marketing. Hi, my name is Jake Vossenkemper, Director of Agronomy and Research here at Liquor Grow. Hi, I'm Katie Hess, Director of Sales and Marketing here at Liquor Grow. Dr. Jake, I haven't seen you all summer. You've been going your way, I've been going my way, and we have a lot to get back on course here and talk about. So today I'm gonna let you talk about two topics. Let's just delve right into this topic about co-applied nutrition and what that really means. We just came off of our Rose of Results tour. Thank you to everybody who came. Um, had a lot of really good feedback we from did. that. Mm -hmm. And this co-applied nutrition is something that continually got asked throughout the three days. So go yeah. ahead, take it away. All right, so Katie, when you apply fertilizer nutrients together, oftentimes I'm gonna use the word synergy, meaning that they work together to increase each other's availability and ultimately potentially increase crop yield. Sure. <clears throat> okay. And I'm not gonna get into the crazy deep details on this little video, but there are other times where I have got into that. Maybe we can put those links on here. But essentially, when you apply nitrogen, when I say when I say nitrogen, that could just be the 20 to 25 pounds of ammonium that you're applying with the P source. Like our P source is 1032O. That's the analysis, right? So when you're applying that nitrogen with that P source, that nitrogen is actually making the phosphorus more available. And in the simple terms, it's because when that ammonium nitrifies to nitrate, it's an acid producing process and that acidity helps increase the P availability. Okay. Okay. So it's kind of the nitrogen that's mixed up with the phosphorus analysis mm -hmm. is um, changing the environment enough that the phosphorus is available for plant uptake. Yes, and it's particularly the case because it's That's applied, all he had to say to begin with. It's particularly with. the case because it's applied in a band. Does that make sense? Yes. So, that, so the nitrogen and the phosphorus are very closely associated with one another in a band. It does happen if you broadcast it too, but the nitrogen and the phosphorus isn't as closely associated with one another. So it's kind of changing that environment because it's a little more uh, concentrated Correct. right there in the stream of liquid fertilizer that's going along the on the ground yes and that acidity can really have an effect when it's in a band if, if the acidity change was buffered by the bulk soil it wouldn't be as dramatic okay. okay now also in many 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 cases we also have some ammonium thiosulfate in our product in our suspension fertilizer okay so with that 1032o there's going to be some ammonium thiosulfate in there in many cases okay ammonium thiosulfate oxidizes and all that means is it changes into sulfate. Right. Okay? And that change also creates acidity. So when so when when ATS goes to sulfate sulfur, there's some oxidation that happens. And that oxidation is, is an acid forming process. That also drops the pH of the band. Okay. And dropping the pH of the band again helps increase the phosphorus uptake, the phosphorus availability but it also increases the zinc availability. So both the nitrification, the, the acidification from the nitrification of the ammonium and the oxidation of ATS to sulfate also reduces the pH and reducing that pH also increases the zinc uptake. So it's not only the phosphorus, but it's the zinc as well. So if you look at zinc availability and soil pH, zinc is way more plant available at a pH of four than it is a pH of seven. So it's really the drop in the pH is making the phosphorus more available and it's making the zinc more available, okay? So Jake, the question's gonna be, okay, then why are we always trying to fertilize, or to, to change our pH into lime, our soils to a higher pH, if in reality this stuff is more available at lower pHs? That's where it gets a little bit complicated, okay? And I'm gonna try to explain that in simple terms. So, when crops, corn and soybean, are taking up anions like nitrate, sulfate, they actually have to increase the pH, so raise the pH right outside the, the root zone, which is called the rhizosphere. And that pH can get to eight, eight and a half, maybe even nine in some cases, if the crop is rapidly taking up anions. Sure. Okay? And so when that pH gets that high, when you have a phosphorus ion that's moving, gravitating toward the root, and we're on the microscopic level here, when it hits that zone of high pH, that phosphorus can turn into calcium phosphate right before it gets taken up by the root, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the pH is high, all right? And so what happens is when you band apply nutrients and you have a root there by that nutrients where the pH is low, 
that counteracts the effect of the high pH in the rhizosphere and that stops that phosphorus from being tied up with the calcium and turning into calcium phosphate because calcium phosphate is not plant available. So it's kind of overcompensating for the changes in pHs because of the roots. Yes, correct. That's sort of. No, no, it definitely is. So okay. if, if that root is growing through that band of phosphorus, nitrogen, zinc, sulfur, the, the, the plant is not going to be able to increase the pH outside the rhizosphere. So in that little bitty portion of the root, maybe that's bad for nitrate uptake. Yeah. Right. But it's good for phosphorus and zinc uptake. Okay. Okay. So, um, back on this banding trail, anything else then on that part? Um, in other videos and just in the industry in general, we know generally speaking that high phosphorus soil test levels, or if you apply phosphorus in high concentrations, that can actually reduce zinc it, it can it can reduce zinc uptake or you could say if you have zinc in there it leads to more consistent larger yield increases from zinc right okay, we, we we generally have known that for a long time you asked me on a video several years back well why is that i did um do you think that these this germplasm is requiring more zinc so what katie's doing is she's looking for an explanation for why i see this yeah <laughs> that's what i'm always doing and uh, Katie, the truth is, I don't know. You did, and I said, well, we You've really- been thinking about that for that long? No, there's some new research. Okay. <laughs> you, you know, I said, we're not sure, and we weren't, right? We, we don't know if, the, if, the, if the, the phosphorus fertilizer itself ties up the zinc. We don't know if it's the high concentrations of phosphorus in the soil that ties up the zinc in the soil. We don't know if it was a plant uptake problem. We didn't know if it was a reallocation within the plant problem. We sure. didn't know, for sure, right? But there was some really new, I'm talking like less than six months old research published by Dr. Chad Penn. Uh, Dr. Penn is a soil chemist. I actually know Dr. Penn from my time at Oklahoma State. He's actually with the USDA ARS unit at Ohio State now. And he did some really great hydroponics work um, trying to understand what's happening with phosphorus and zinc. Okay. And what they found is that it wasn't really a tie-up issue in the soil solution itself it's a tie-up issue in the roots. So whenever oh. roots have really high concentrations of phosphorus, the zinc that are, it's also in the roots cannot be transported up into the aerial plant parts, okay? How did he do that? Did he like? They dissected plants yeah. and they grew these in hydroponics with different phosphorus concentrations and zinc concentrations in the hydroponics. I mean, it's all they have to like work. grind it all down and? Yes, they oh. have, absolutely. You have to dissect the plants and grind the plant parts down and grind the roots down. Sure. Very detailed stuff, right? In addition to that, what they Not also found is that manganese, whenever you had high phosphorus concentrations in the roots, they also found that manganese was not transported up into the upper leaf area. Okay. And what do we find in a lot of tissue tests? We find that low boron's manganese. low, zinc's low, and manganese is low. And that's mm -hmm. pretty consistent. And this helps answer the question why zinc and manganese are often a lot of times low in the tissue. So is that why tissue applied, foliar applied, zinc manganese boron type products is sometimes that that could be it so you could can be. just avoid the roots altogether. you can avoid the roots altogether that very well could be i haven't done a lot of foliar applied zinc work but what i can tell you is that that's one of the most consistent micronutrients that i that's that's the micronutrient where i see the most consistent largest yield increases from now this is just a question off the cuff here but why all of a sudden in the last 15 years is zinc even on the radar is it is it the hybrids that we're getting these days have different genetics to them so they require more zinc is it the atmosphere similar to sulfur is it our soils here in the midwest are different and don't well we've been growing high yielding crops on these soils for you know decades right? sure and you know there is a decent amount of zinc in iowa soils just generally speaking but over time we've probably depleted zinc in our soils the other thing is we have higher yields than we've ever had before and if you want 300 bushel corn you have to have more zinc uptake that's mm -hmm. just the math okay sure. so it's it's depletion over time it's we have higher yielding crops than we've ever had before and we've probably had well i shouldn't say probably i know we've had phosphorus soil test levels in general that have crap up over time right so it's probably a combination of the three and oftentimes that's the way these things work usually there's never one factor that results in a change usually mm -hmm. it's several factors that work together to result in a change okay and i'm not saying that every single acre in the state of iowa needs zinc but what i'm telling you is in my research that's the most consistent yield increase that i see from a micronutrient is zinc 
Now, is it because I'm often applying zinc with phosphorus? That, that could be too. Um, but I see consistent yield increases with zinc, and we as a company commonly apply phosphorus and zinc together, so that's saying that that's probably something that's pretty important for our customers. Okay, so back on this banding, did we catch all everything you wanted to talk about on the banding side of things and co-applying nutrients? There's, there's more to banding than just the these interactions between nutrients. It's also about reducing phosphorus high up in the soil. Um, I can tell you that, you know, a lot of people say, ah, if your pH is good, there's no phosphorus type. That's that's somewhat true, but it's not exactly 100% true. The minute you apply phosphorus, some of that is starting to get tied up with calcium. And that's probably the biggest culprit, and there's a lot of it in the soil solution, but also some with aluminum and iron. Um, but usually that can remineralize. So, so if it's tied up with calcium, it's calcium phosphate. And usually that can remineralize later in the growing season in these p soils that have a you know, a pH between six and seven. Okay? Okay. So usually it's not a huge problem, but it does get temporarily tied up. And the problem with mineralization or becoming reavailable is you don't know exactly when or how much you know, that's gonna happen in the future, right? But when you have pHs that are really low or really high, now the phosphorus gets changed into, into compounds that are harder to become available. Right, they don't just remineralize easy. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we want to keep our pH in the right place, and that's going to be the biggest help to keeping phosphorus available. But it's not exactly true that it's fine. Okay, <laughs> so we can band really easily. That's part of what these why these suspensions exist is it's we can apply them in many different ways. We can broadcast apply them if you want if you have a reason to do that. But when in doubt, you should band because it can be helpful to reducing phosphorus type. Okay, so we've got 15 inch dribble bands and then most recently we've gone to exact strips where it's 30 inch rows um, and then we're planting where the row is gonna be the next spring, which requires RTK capabilities. Um, but now if a farmer doesn't have RTK and they're thinking, boy, is my 15 inch rows even good enough? Let's kind of hit on that. We've had a, some discussion about that over the summer. Okay, Jake, it got a little too hot out there for the GoPros, so we're back inside now. In, uh, in the middle of September. I know, that's why I'm still wearing short sleeves. I'm going, <laughs> can it just turn already? Yep. All right, so let's just continue talking about that 15 inch row dribble band versus yep. the 30 inch rows on the exact strips. Yep. And if customers should be worried about that at all. So we were talking about with the 15 inch dribble bands, you get uniform application, you get the banding, and all the good things about the banding, right? And so that system's not broken at all. But my job as our agronomy researcher is to help make everything we offer better well and right? the new discoveries i mean things are always absolutely. moving forward we need to that's, keep moving forward yeah, absolutely that's why we do research to find sure. the new and better things so what i found is that if you want another three or four bushel on top of that five bushel applying your nutrients where you're going to plant the crop is better than the 15 inch triple bands and that's because you're getting more of the root system associated with that banding and all the good things we talked about banding but in addition to that, you artificially inflate the nutrient concentrations of the soil in the spot where you're gonna plant the crop. So basically what you're saying is the roots don't know that that zone is, well, the roots think that the zone is like super high in nutrients and they don't know outside of what it, the yep. zone area. Yep. And so it's like, whose life is good. Let's yep. keep growing and let's keep making more roots right here. Yep, absolutely. And so that probably sets the good yield. Good thing you have me, look that at that. probably sets the yield trajectory, but also if you have 120 part per million of K in the bulk soil, you can create an area where most of the roots are that is, you know, maybe 180 part per million of K, for example, right? So that's what you get with the precision placement, the exact strip application. And it's not too late if we're going into fall right now. I know I'm seeing combines rolling all over the place, but it's not too late to do some exact strips nope. planning and talk to your agronomy field advisor. They can help get you moved in the right direction for that. Absolutely. Now, you said there was m lots of things that you wanted to talk about. Did we cover all of the things that we... Yeah, I wanted to talk about zinc. I wanted to talk about 15-inch triple banding, the banding, the uniform application, and then why you might consider going to the exact strip, which is the next level of precision placement. I think okay. we covered it. Okay, Jake. Well, thanks for taking your time to be here with us today. Thanks to everybody else who came to the Rose of Results this last week. We had a great turnout, like I said earlier. And um, if you need to get in touch with Jake, call one of your agronomy field advisors and we'll We'll get you guys in touch. Thanks for your time and have a happy, safe harvest. Stay in the know with LicoGrow.